man, that guy needs this series, doesn't he? <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to Stony Creek Church on this beautiful summer day. You want to get your outline out so you can follow along with this morning's message. The other day, I happened to see an interview with the famous TV talk show host and psychologist, Dr. Phil. Yes, Dr. Phil McGraw. Dr. Phil's career as a TV therapist all began when Oprah Winfrey first introduced him on her show in the late 90s. And he, she talked about how he had been of such great to, uh, help to her, had kind of saved her psyche. And since 2002, Dr. Phil's success has become legendary. His career just skyrocketed, and his name has become a household word. Dr. Phil is known for his reality TV counseling, where viewers can actually see his techniques in action. And after watching uh, some of that interview with Dr. Phil, I started thinking about his style in relation to our series here on anger. The ultimate counselor is God. Is that not correct? Yes, indeed. He's even called the wonderful counselor. Wouldn't it be fascinating to sit in and watch God in a counseling session, helping a person deal with anger issues? Well, today is part four in our series, All the Rage, actually the concluding message. And the title of today's message is Seeing the Perfect Therapist. So far in this series, we've learned from Scripture that not all anger is bad. Some anger is actually good and necessary and helpful. But even good anger has a very short shelf life. You have to deal with it, you need to handle it very carefully and uh, properly. We've learned about getting foul language and inner anger out of our lives and the critical importance of forgiveness. We've talked about what forgiveness is and what it is not. Last Sunday, we learned that anger uh, is as serious as hell. And I mean that literally. And it needs immediate attention. Today, we wrap up this series with a unique opportunity. Nowhere else in Scripture do we see anything quite like this. An opportunity to sit in on a session with Dr. God, if you will, in an actual counseling uh, appointment with uh, a client, if you will, or a patient. It's found in Genesis chapter 4, and we have it there on your outline if you'd like to follow along on that, or perhaps you want to look at the um, U version uh, where you can find the outline and the scripture as well. Just uh, go to events there. Uh, let's look at this uh, passage. We're going to read the whole thing and Please help me out when we come to the yellow print. It says, Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, With the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also presented a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry. And he looked dejected. Please help me. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? Will you be accepted if you do what is right? If you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. 
but you must subdue it and be its master. One day, Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. Cain replied to the Lord, My punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord replied, No, for I will give, you, I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is the word of the Lord, brothers and sisters. Cain was literally the first person born. Of course, Adam and Eve were created. And so, this means Cain was the first to ever have a belly button, you know? I wonder if that made him feel insecure at first. I mean, he's the only, only one to have a belly button. He looks at his mom and dad, and they don't have one. Imagine how freaky pregnancy and childbirth must have been for Eve the very first time. She doesn't know what's going on. Her belly all of a sudden starts to grow. That can't be good. She gets strange flutterings inside, and which turn into uh, kicks. She doesn't know why. Then one day she has this tremendous pain, and then a few hours later, this person starts coming out of her. How weird. You can imagine her excitement. You can kind of hear it through the pages here where it says, I have received a man from the Lord. I have produced a mini-man. You know, she's just really excited about this. When Cain was born, Adam and Eve were delirious with joy. They had to be. What promise this new life, this new birth had? Eve says he's from the Lord. You may remember, if you've read the book of Genesis, that back in chapter 3, God promised that a son from Eve would crush the serpent's head. In other words, would destroy the snake, the devil. And undoubtedly, they, they must have at least hoped or even thought, hey, here he is. This is the one who's going to save us from the trouble that we got into. And then, of course, Abel, the second son, came along. Abel grows up to be a shepherd, and Cain, a farmer. But unfortunately, Cain is better known for being the first murderer, the first murderer recorded in Scripture. What started with such promise quickly turns into a story of sibling rivalry, anger, envy, and then murder. In our story, God steps in to help Cain, twice actually, as we might say, a sort of therapist, Dr. God, if you will. Why did God like Abel's offering, but did not like Cain's offering? People have wondered about this, rightly so. Some have suggested that it was because Abel offered an animal sacrifice, which required blood, and blood is needed for atonement for sin, but Cain, on the other hand, just offered veggies. And you can't get blood out of a turnip, as they say, or out of a tomato. It just isn't going to happen. And so that's why God didn't like Cain's offering. But this isn't going to work. 
that explanation is no good. These were free will offerings, folks. These were not offerings to atone for sin in this case. And God would later make it clear in the Mosaic Law that veggies were perfectly acceptable as free will offerings. And so what then was wrong with Cain's offering? The answer, Cain, is what was wrong with Cain's offering. Cain was all filled up with attitude, with jealousy, with resentment. He had major anger issues. And if what's inside is anger and hatred and, and murderous thoughts, and outside is a religious ceremony, well, <laughs> God calls that hypocrisy. And so that is what was wrong with, with Cain's offering. You'll notice here that the Lord has two, uh, what I'm calling therapy sessions with Cain, and neither one is effective. Notice that, neither one is effective. After the first counseling session, what does Cain do? He, he storms out and murders his brother. A lot of good that did, you know. And then after the second session, Cain stomps out of God's office and never returns. There is not a happy ending for this story. One man is dead and another ends up alienated from God. God who tried to help him. Cain refuses God's help. This shows us, folks, that not all problems are fixable. Not even God can fix you if you refuse to be fixed. But even so, we can still learn some great lessons from this story. And I have them uh, summarized there on your outline under three points. Three things you need to do Three things I should say you need to accept to deal with your anger. What are those three things? You, you say, I, I got some anger, I need to deal with it. Well, there are three things you need to accept. All right? So there's something available, three things in particular that you need to accept. The first is point number one, and that is God's grace. God's grace, it may sound kind of nebulous or trite, but no, God's grace is indispensable. And this story is dripping with God's kindness, his grace to Cain, even though Cain didn't seek out God's help and certainly didn't deserve it. What is grace? Well, very simply, grace can be defined as God's undeserved kindness. It is kindness that is unmerited, undeserved. And twice God seeks out Cain to speak with him. Now how this took place, we are not told. Did God appear to Cain in some form? Did Cain hear an audible voice? Did God email him or text him or something like that? Why? Or did God just speak to Cain's heart? We're not told. But what I find so astounding is that in both encounters, the Lord takes the initiative to counsel Cain. It isn't Cain who says, you know, I got some anger issues. I need to deal with this. I need to get some help. I'm going to Google for a good therapist and set up an appointment. No. That's not what happens. God takes the initiative. How many therapists do you know who come to you if you've got a problem and, and say, look, you know, I hear you got some anger issues. You look like you're kind of stressed. I've got an opening tomorrow. What do you say we set up an appointment? You come by my office and we can talk about it. It doesn't usually happen that way. You usually have to take the initiative. You have to seek out help. But it's always, this always happens with the Lord. He takes the initiative. Scripture teaches that man never makes the first move. It's always God 
You say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I started seeking God. Guess what? If you are seeking God, it's because he began seeking you, drawing you. It always starts with God. Scripture teaches this from cover to cover. Uh, the Bible says it's not in our sinful nature to seek God. He always has to take the first move. We'll never seek out God any more than a chicken is going to seek out Colonel Sanders. We always go in the other direction. In their first session, the Lord urges Cain to accept his help, to take responsibility, to do the hard work of correcting his anger issues. When Cain blows off God's advice and murders his brother anyway, God amazingly, amazingly steps in to set up another session with Cain to confront him and to correct him. This is astounding to me. God, God doesn't administer the death penalty to Cain. That's what he deserved. That's what God would later prescribe under the Mosaic law. He doesn't even put Cain on death row here. Instead, the Lord provides special protection for Cain. He puts a mark on him, and we're not told what that, that is. And that mark is to protect him against vengeance seekers. So God shows grace to Cain after his horrible crime. Nothing short of incredible. God always takes the initiative with us, too. That's his grace. That's his undeserved kindness. When anger invades your life and lingers on past its due date, its expiration date, he's that still, small voice inside that says, easy now, calm down, come to me for help. Forgive and receive my forgiveness. You ever notice that? When you're convicted of your sin, it's the Lord. He's the one who's dealing with you that way. He may say it to you while you're reading Scripture. He may uh, say it to you while you're listening to a, crisp, uh, a song or while you're worshiping in church. You feel this, this inner tug to deal with something. He may be saying it to you right now. The Lord, he takes that initiative. Don't blow him off. He's constantly taking the initiative. And this is what we were just singing about, God's reckless love. Sometimes it really does seem reckless, like it does in this passage here. It just seems lavish. It seems overboard. God always takes the initiative. He showers his grace on us. The best example, of course, is the cross. Now imagine, just imagine that you ran up a, a huge debt, millions of dollars if it, if it were possible, a debt that you could never hope to repay, and now it's come crashing down on you, and it's due, and you're in despair, you're at your wit's end, you know you can't deal with this, you're considering ending your life. But then you hear the news that your grandfather left something for you, something in a safety deposit box that's locked away in the bank. And in the box, when they open it up, it has a note in there that says, your, by the way, your grandfather, he died. He died just after you were born. So he knew that you, who you were, but he didn't know what you were going to do. Or so it seemed. The note says this is to pay your debt, and with that note is a certified check for the millions that you owe. He took the initiative. That's what God in Jesus Christ did for you long before you were born, 2,000 years ago. Before you even incurred the debt, he paid for it on the cross. He made the first move because he loves you. That's grace. That's undeserved kindness. But as with Cain, folks, 
And here's the catch, if there is a catch, and there is. Grace must be received for it to do you any good. If you don't hold your hand out like this, but you turn it around and make a fist, hold it upside down like this, the grace will just spill over you and you won't get any of it because you refuse it, not because it isn't there. What Cain should have done and what we need to do when dealing with anger or any issue is to admit our need for God's grace and to accept his help. Just imagine if Cain had said in that first session, Lord, you're right, you're right. I am consumed with anger. And Abel hasn't done anything wrong. It's, it's the wrong is within me. I'm, I'm jealous, I'm envious, I'm angry, and I need help, and I, I, I can't help myself. Please help me. That first murder wouldn't have happened in this relationship. It would have happened somewhere else. Not here. Not by Cain. Sadly, Cain doesn't respond well to God's therapy. He whines, he moans, and ends up walking out of God's office in the end, never to return, leaving us with one of the saddest statements in Scripture, where it says, So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. That's a sad sentence. Nod. In Hebrew, that means wandering. He's wandering. He's, he's lost. Cain settles in a land where he will sire a whole family tree of rebels resisting God, shaking their fists in defiance against him. Cain refused God's grace and therefore He's doomed to wander in the decay of his bad choice. Grace is offered to everyone, to you and to me, far more than condemning you, wanting to condemn you. God wants to help you. He loves you. And his message is accept his grace. Turn to him. That's number one. That's the basis of everything here. Secondly, second thing you need to accept to deal with your anger is the responsibility. In both of the counseling sessions, what I'm calling counseling sessions with Cain, the Lord is urging him to take responsibility for his emotions and his behavior. In the first session, God, like, like any good therapist, asks very insightful and penetrating questions. He asks, why are you so angry? Oh, that's a great question. Why do you look so dejected? In other words, what's the root issue of your anger, Cain? What's this really all about? This is state-of-the-art psychology. When we're angry... The first question we need to ask ourselves is, why am I angry? In other words, do I have a right to be angry? If I do have a right to be angry, in other words, I have good anger, I see real injustice, and I'm angry about it, okay, that's good, then I need to deal with it properly. You can have good anger and then express it in a bad way. So how do I deal with this anger in a good way? Several months ago, someone here at the church was fired from her job at a Christian organization for a very unjust cause. Stony Creek Church supported this Christian organization financially, and so I was angry. And I asked myself, do I have a right to be angry? Is this good anger? And as I thought it through, prayed about it, I thought, I, I, this is good anger. Question is, what do I do about it? Well, I decided to call up 
the leader of that organization to speak directly with him about this situation. I explained to him politely, look, I want to hear your side of the story. Explain this to me. I'm, I'm not making assumptions here. I just want to hear your side of the story. And when he gave his explanation, and after I had listened patiently, and his answer didn't satisfy me, I graciously yet firmly expressed my disappointment in his organization. And I suggested that he take some concrete steps to correct the matter. He thanked me. He promised to get back with me. The matter never got resolved the way I had hoped that it would, but I knew I had done the right thing with my anger. Many times I have not done the right thing with my anger, but this was one example where I did and I felt better about it. We often say, we hear this all the time, he makes me so angry, he really pushes my button, I can't stand it, right? We say that ourselves, but the truth is, no one can make me angry. Anger is my choice. You know, I have looked, and I have never found this button on me somewhere that somebody pushes, and automatically I become angry. We use the expression, he pushes my button, but I've never found the button. It's not my belly button. But don't push my belly button, all right? Please. Might get me angry. You never know. <clears throat> I bet the same is true of you. There's no button on you that somebody pushes and automatically you become angry. You're not a light switch. No one has control over you to force you to become angry. You're not a robot. It's your choice. What are you doing? I mean, even that expression, it gives this idea that somebody presses this button and all of a sudden you're forced to become angry. Like it's, it's just the other person's responsibility. It's, it's not yours. Anger is an automatic thing. You push the button and there it goes. You blow up. Well, if it's a choice, and if I have the responsibility whether or not to choose to be angry, how do I accept the responsibility. Well, I'm suggesting here, always ask, why am I angry? That's God's question to Cain. Why am I angry? Do I have a right to be angry? If I don't have a right to be angry, in other words, it's just my wounded pride or my selfishness or maybe my grumpy mood that I'm in that day, then I need to own that. I need to confess that and, and dump it, right? If it's bad anger, I, I need to deal with it before the Lord, maybe make it right with the per if, if somebody, I, I snapped at somebody or whatever, and then dump that anger. In Cain's case, his anger was unjust. Abel did nothing wrong. By the way, why did Cain kill Abel? Why did Cain kill his brother? Because he was able, right? Yeah, all right, there you go. And I think it's true. It really is true because Cain was jealous. Cain was really the answer, the, really the problem. He was resentful of him. It, it just, what he saw in his brother, he hated. Plain and simple, but instead of owning it and confessing to the Lord and properly dealing with it, he continued to blame his brother. He's the problem. And so Cain's horrid solution was to vent his anger on Abel. Now, we all get angry at times, often for stupid reasons, right? Or is it just me? That's totally normal. Mary, quiet. <laughs> I heard that. You're making me angry. That's totally normal, especially when it's provoked, right? The key is how do we deal with it, right? First, admit it. 
admit your anger. Say to yourself, I'm angry. You might even say, if you're talking with the person, just, I'm, I'm angry with you right now. I don't like what I see. I don't like what I'm hearing. You don't need to deny that. Quite to the contrary, admit that. We always seem to refuse to admit that we're angry. I'm not angry. And yet it's obvious that we are. Own it. Well, then what do I do? Well, if it's bad anger, do I own it or do I blame someone like Cain did? If it's good anger, then I need to look for a constructive way of handling that anger. And God will provide a constructive way to do it if we go to Him and seek Him before it goes bad on you, right? Before it's expiration date. Let's look at the third thing you need to do to ex- uh, a third uh, thing you need to accept to deal with your anger. And that is you need to accept the fight. Dealing with anger is not a one-time event after which you finish it and you say, okay, done with anger, now let's move on to the next thing. No way, it's an ongoing battle, it's a fight. And if you retreat from the fight, you lose. Not the fight with the, the person, the fight within yourself. To win, you have to fight. You have to fight this battle. A chronically angry person is one who has retreated from this fight and has taken out that inner anger on other people, people around him. Notice God's words to Cain in verse 6. He says, but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. What I find fascinating here is that God doesn't just heal Cain of his anger. Do you notice that? God doesn't perform a miracle here. And this is Almighty God. He doesn't say to Cain, now now hold it right there, Cain, as I zap you. I'm going to get rid of your anger. And that's what we usually pray to God, right? Take this away from me. Take this desire away from me. Just zap me, Lord, so I'm no longer like this. But God doesn't do that. Now, sometimes God performs miracles in ways with addictions and all that. I don't want to deny that by any means. But most of the time, He deals with us the way He deals with Cain here. He tells Cain, you're going to have to work on this. You're going to have to gain control over this. You must master this. And notice how God portrays, Dr. God portrays sin in this text. He says, sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. In other words, sin is going to claim power over you. It's going to claim the power to control you. It's going to claim to push your button. It's got this button-pushing mentality here. But you have to deny that. You have to say, no, 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 I'm not going to fall for that. Nobody makes me angry. You must gain control over it. As soon as you walk out the door in this picture that God paints of sin in this passage, it's poised to pounce on you and wrestle you to the ground and make you say, uncle. But instead, you have to win the fight, God says. You have to come up on top. So this indicates a a struggle. This indicates a fight, a battle. And it's a battle, apparently, that you can win. Folks, sin is not just bad choices. Of course, it includes that, definitely. But according to this text and many others in Scripture, sin is actually a power within us that draws us, that pulls us to do wrong. 
Uh, the Bible calls this our sin nature. And on your outline, you'll have there an, an opportunity to write this in. Uh, our sin nature, what is that? It's our inborn inclination to do evil. It's that pull, that propensity to do the wrong thing. That's why evil appeals to us, because we have our sin nature. God says our problem is ultimately not due to bad environment or poor education or poverty. Of course, those may be contributing factors, but the problem with humanity is within. You look in your mirror and that's where you'll find your problem. And this means we can't blame others for our bad behavior like Abel was trying to do. Or I should say Cain was trying to do by blaming his brother Abel. We have to own it and then fight it. Now, how do we do that? Well, first, as we learned earlier, we need to accept God's grace. And this is so hugely important. You go to him for help. If this story teaches us anything, it's that God takes the initiative to help us and we need to accept it. Later in Scripture, we learn that this comes through surrendering yourself to Jesus Christ as the leader, the Lord of your life. This is where it all starts. When you first become a follower and then every day afterward, you, it's a continual surrender to Him. We can't defeat anger or any form of sin in our own strength. Not going to happen. It takes the grace of God working in and through us. Secondly, God wants us to have a part in the fight. He doesn't just zap you, miraculously clean you up and, and say, now it's never going to be an issue for you. No, we need to learn to trust God day by day as we apply scriptural principles so important. Learn humility through trial and error and become accountable to others. You have a buddy that, that prays with you, a, a Christian friend that, that holds you accountable, asks you how you're doing, prays for you, encourages you. And of course, to develop self-discipline. This is huge, huge. In practical terms, this means if I have an anger issue, I need to get serious about beating it. Did you know that the 12-step the, the step recovery approach was thought up originally by Christians? It's used by all kinds of people and groups these days, but it started off with Christians simply putting some scriptural principles into practice. And that's why it's been so successful. First of all, admit that you're helpless to beat the problem on your own. Secondly, look to God as your hope. They call him the higher power in many cases. But it started with look to God as your only hope for wholeness. Three, decide to turn your life over to God to help you. Four, admit to yourself God and another person, the exact nature of your problem. You've got to own it. You've got to be real about it. You've got to accept it and, and really seek that help. And, of course, the, the steps go on. If you have an anger issue, you need to seek somebody out to help you. Somebody who's trained in Scripture, counseling, counseling, uh, maybe set up with uh, Celebrate Recovery here at, at Stony Creek Church. Great ministry under the, the leadership of uh, Chris and Hannah Nelson. Very, very helpful. But often the follow-up includes working through your issue with somebody who, who's trained to, to help you and keep you on track. This is so important. And through that fight, your faith and your strength 
are going to grow, you have to declare war on your bad anger. You must determine to get a strategy to work with it, to work out of it, to, to whoop it, I should say. The story of Cain is pathetic. God steps in to counsel Cain and Cain walks away unfixed. What does this tell us and, and how does it help us? Well, the lesson is so huge and so grand, it's easy to miss it. It's so basic. It's wrapped up in our main idea. The one thing you want to remember if you forget everything else, I say. And if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, you'll want to write it down. It goes like this. If you refuse God's grace, even he can't help you. Startling, isn't it? But it's true. God is not going to force anybody to be helped. Forced love is rape, and God is not a cosmic rapist. If you refuse God's grace, even he can't help you. We don't like to hear this. We live in a quick-fix society where we want so badly to believe that no cause is ever forever lost. No one is ever unredeemable. We want to believe that. Notice God leaves the door open for Cain as he walks away from the Lord, but tragically Cain never comes back. He goes on to spawn a whole family tree of God-haters, God-rejecters. The fact is, the only person who's unfixable is the person who refuses to be fixed refuses God's grace. We all need fixing, folks. We all need God's grace. We just need to admit that. And the good news is, it's free. It's available for all of us in Jesus. The number one therapist in the universe is ready to help you. Now, today, don't refuse it. 